from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to this special edition of U.S. Farm Report. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's ahead. USDA's latest crop report shines some positive light on corn. Demand is going to be a big story. The Fed raised interest rates this week, but can farmers withstand another hike? And then our focus shifts to ag tech from the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo, and it's a glimpse into the future. I think it's those technologies are going to start to change our business model, at the same time giving us more information to give to our end users to understand how we're operating our farms and adding value to their products to the consumers. And it's a double dose of John's World this week. New technology, it's got a learning curve. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest-lasting, full-size pickups on the road. Now for the news. A strong U.S. economy helping fuel the Federal Reserve's decision this week to raise the benchmark interest rate for a third time this year. The Federal Reserve bumping the rate up to 1.5 percent from the current 1.25 percent. Now the move largely expected, but with signals that inflation will continue to gain strength in the coming months, the Fed also suggesting that more interest rate hikes are ahead. I recently sat down with an ag lender who says the majority of farmers and ranchers can withstand a slight bump in interest rates. The Fed is at least signaling that they might go up maybe up to a full percentage point between now and the end of 2018. Definitely our producers can handle something like that. And there's just no indication out there that we're going to see this huge rise in interest rates. We do a sensitivity analysis for our customers to show that, so that, and we usually use a 3% increase. Mm -hmm. What impact is there? So if, if rates go up 3%, do they still have a positive debt coverage ratio? A little bullish news for corn this week. That's as the U.S. Department of Agriculture released its December supply and demand reports. Corn ending stocks for the 2017 to 2018 crop came in at 2.4 billion bushels. It's slightly lower than pre-report estimates. The Ag Department raised corn use for ethanol by 50 million bushels. Demand is going to be a big story. You know, I think most of the trade is pretty comfortable with the U.S. production number from this past growing season. And what we're going to focus on now is, is demand. U.S. corn is really cheap on the world market. We're very competitive, so I would not be surprised to see export demand improve just a little bit. Now, soybean ending stocks are pegged at 445 million bushels and a bit higher than pre-report estimates. The increase in stocks is due to reduced exports of U.S. soybeans. Now, wheat ending stocks set at 960 million bushels. Well, cotton farmers are looking at record yields. The Ag Department pushed its cotton production forecast slightly higher to 21.4 million bales. It's less than 1% above its November forecast and 25% over last year. The national average yield for cotton is 902 pounds per bale, which would be a record for the U.S. And it could be a story of plentiful peanuts for southern farmers this year as well. That's as a record number of acres were planted this spring, and now those farmers are seeing higher yields. USDA says that could produce the largest peanut crop ever, with expectations for the crop to hit 7.6 billion pounds. The previous record was 6.7 billion in 2012. Record yields are forecast for Georgia, Mississippi, and South Carolina. Now the question is if peanut exports can keep up, those exports have already doubled since 2011. And hurricane damage is continuing to eat into Florida's orange crop. The Ag Department puts the Florida all orange forecast at 46 million boxes. That's a decline of 8% from last month's estimate and 33% lower from last year's final numbers. And California could now become the nation's top orange producer. Agriculture's national forecast is brought to you by Elevo Seed Treatment from Bayer. All right, now it's time to check in with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. Mike, some folks may be traveling early for the holidays next week. How's the weather shaping up for early holiday travel? Well, thanks, Ty, and obviously travelers are going to have to watch the forecast because we it appears like much colder air is going to come back into the middle of the country as we head through the end of next week when a lot of folks are taken off. So that could mean some snow in places. Let's look at the drought monitor. Uh, a month ago, we were getting drier and drier in Arkansas, southern Missouri. It was starting to dry out in the Carolinas. It was already a drought in uh, the Dakotas into Montana. But over the past uh, four weeks, we've seen it get worse and worse over Arkansas and lots of the surrounding area. This has been an expanding area of dryness. And at this point, unless we see a storm coming out of the southwest at some point over the next week or two, I don't see that getting any better yet. And it continues to be on the dry side in the Carolinas and other parts of the southeast. 
As we start this week on Monday, a weak storm system with a little bit of snow in the eastern lakes. Otherwise, just a few scattered showers. This is not a drought buster in any way, shape or form. Just a hit and miss throughout this uh, cold front and a stationary front back across Texas. Cold front coming into the northern uh, tier of states with a little bit of snow. That front then uh, moves off of New England by Wednesday and a warm air mass tries to come back in again. A little bit of rain along the, uh, the Gulf Coast you can see there, but that'll be snow. Northern Plains back into the Rockies and then the cold air comes in. That storm system over the Great Lakes. Blast of cold air coming southward. Snow across the Great Lakes, but rain up and down the East Coast, maybe a little snow along that stationary front in the northern Rockies. We'll be back in our next half hour with a longer range outlook. Thanks, Mike. We'll set tight because when we come back, Elaine Cub and John Payne are in to take a look at markets heading into the Christmas holiday. We'll be right back. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Corvus Pre-Emergence Corn Herbicide from Bayer. The only herbicide to offer three levels of defense against weeds, burn down, residual, and activation with rain. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Excited for the roundtable discussion that we're going to have with Elaine Cub and John Payne. Um, Elaine, we'll start with you. I mean, we had a USDA report out this week. You know, looked like we, we would see some more demand for, for corn, uh, but prices sure aren't acting that way, Elaine. No, absolutely not. That was the one little piece of news, and it was a good piece of news, that ethanol demand was boosted 50 million bushels, taking it up to 5.5 billion bushels total, which is almost as much as the feed demand category. Hmm. So that's good news for ethanol and uh, good news for corn. It's perhaps based on the higher energy prices that we're seeing around the globe. So that's good, but not good enough to really matter to the prices received by farmers. Yeah, John, why isn't it enough? Well, that's a good question. I mean, as we were talking before we went on the air here, the basis has come in, so you're starting to see that domestic use for corn show up in the end price. But as far as the board goes, I think there's just a lot more factored in. I'm not sure if it's NAFTA or you're looking at some sort of kind of macro fear out there in regarding to RFS, but any rally we've seen above six or seven cents in the last month has just been hammered back down to contract lows. And Given that the other markets outside commodities have done pretty well, it's a little bit disconcerting thinking that maybe corn on the board could go even a little bit lower um, you know, in the shorter run. Now, I think longer term, it's, it's a, you know, a weather game in South America, and it's all about perception. Uh, perception right now is pretty negative, and, and uh, to think that's going to change in the short run is probably, I think, miscited in my opinion. So, you know, Elaine, you, you both have been on a few times this year, and I know we had talked about it's like a broken record. I mean, prices are kind yeah. of just, just the same, and we're heading into 2018. More of the same, like John mentioned? I mean, are we going to continue to have this sideways trade, really, in the, in the corn market? I think realistically we have to expect to see a neutral outlook for the very long term when you look at the global supplies for feed grains all over and John mentioned South America will probably come up with a relatively large second crop of corn so we have nothing to expect this supply and demand situation this overall supply and demand situation to change for years at a time. So you mentioned 2018. You do look at December 2018 futures at 380, which sounds really good compared to where we are today. So we have to be, as marketers, I think we need to be thinking very long term, looking at, at contracts that far out. So 380 you think is good? <laughs> as she mentioned, I mean, the playbook that has worked has been sell ahead. That's really it. I, I, I've been going around and kind of speaking and, and seeing other people and they're all looking for the secret of how to beat this market. And in reality, that is the game plan. It's sell ahead and if you're wrong, you have to risk 2013, 2014 type markets. Now, I don't think $8 is in the cards, but in a way, if you're sitting on a lot of old crop corn, I don't think it's a horrible gamble to try to price a little bit here early and then use the old crop as a little bit of a cushion on a rally. Well, Elaine, I mean, this week out of this USDA report, we mentioned the corn demands. We thought it was good news, not enough to move the markets, but with soybeans, um, it looks like our soybean exports just aren't there. And, and, yeah. and you know, what's, how does that change the storyline for soybeans moving into 2018? You're right. The first two months of the marketing year, the soybean exports were down 6% compared to a year ago. So then we had today, Friday morning, there was uh, 14 million bushels of soybean export sales announced, and we would hope to see a bounce in the futures. And we did see a temporary bounce, but it's not enough to, to weigh against the fact the Brazilian currency was down, trading below 30 cents today, and palm oil, the edible oil markets globally, have just been tanking. They're down 16% since the beginning of November. So those are the sorts of things that are weighing against soybeans and taking them 
down, yeah. like John mentioned, with just the, the weight on that corn. And I know a lot of rhetoric about South America and the dry weather there, but you know, we did see some rains recently. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of the hopes that we were holding on to that maybe dry weather there could really rally this market seems like may not be something we should bank on. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, you know, like I said ahead, it's if you're banking on that happening, you're going to be right and you're going to get a reward from it. But if it doesn't happen, you're probably seeing a slide in prices down to these levels between 950, 970 for the front month for a while. She didn't even mention the, the acreage story. What could be good for corn with corn acreage for next year is probably going to be negative for soybeans. So over the next month, we'll start to hear estimates for that. I expect bean acreage will be high. Some of the corn guys I talked to and more of the lobby groups thinking maybe we could see 5 million less corn which means more beans. Yeah, but in your areas like where you are in South Dakota, Elaine, how many acres do you think are really going to shift over to soybeans uh, in, in, in some of those places? It's because of the wheat, right? You're, you're referring to the fact that the wheat, that the winter wheat even that has been planted in Kansas, Oklahoma, they're experiencing drought conditions through this winter, so that, that dormant crop is not going to come out of spring very well, could be grazed off, and could be going to soybeans mm -hmm. and imp increasing that soybean acreage even more, absolutely. All right, well, we need to take a quick break, uh, but we need to talk more about wheat. Um, we'll get into cattle, and then, you know, I hear from several viewers that say, why don't you talk cotton more often? Well, John wants to talk cotton this weekend, so we'll do that when we come back on U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Delaro. New Delaro fungicide for corn and soybeans can help you get the edge you're looking for to achieve personal best yields. Delaro, keep raising the bar. This is Machine Repeat, inviting you to check out my new website, MachineRepeat.com, offering farmers tens of thousands of used equipment listings to search. Let Machine Repeat help you find and value your next piece of used equipment. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Again, Elaine Cub and John Payne. Elaine, let's talk a little bit about wheat. Um, when we look at this drought monitor, we're seeing this dryness spread across the U.S. I saw a new forecast um, talking about La Nina and more of an 80% chance of La Nina. What impact is that having on the wheat crop this year? Well, it's not good for the crop, but it's almost nil on the actual charts. You look at the July Kansas City contract for next year, it has had absolutely no response to that concern. It continues trending lower below 450. So I don't know what time frame it would take for that concern to mm -hmm. really develop in there. And the La Nina impact is, is probably more short term and definitely more focused on South America than the U.S. crops at this point. Well, we got an update in um, kind of looking at ending stocks when we look at wheat this week and uh, not good news there either, right? I mean, we have some hefty supplies to chew through. We do, we do, but they're, we're, they're less than they were a year ago. And I think we're starting to cure that problem. I think one issue that I see from just the uh, 20,000 feet would be just we're losing markets. And this week we got news again that Brazil had approved Russian imp uh, import to mm -hmm. that country, which is a wheat export market that we've kind of depended on and uh, much like Egypt that has essentially gone away over the last four years. Uh, I look for Brazil to start to move more product from that country and uh, it's, it's a difficult thing for a wheat producer at this point. Where do you sell it? Um, I think the, the bumper crops that we have are probably, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't bet on that happening again given the drought in, in uh, Kansas right now though. Elaine, how do we become more competitive? How do we make our product more appealing uh, to some of these key areas? The problem with wheat uh, or rice or some of these cereal grains is that the demand is not very elastic. It's not very price sensitive. The countries that need the wheat, they have they had those same needs year after year after year. And we can't really compete with price against some yeah. of these other countries, including Ukraine. And the ever increasing global shipping costs, the Baltic dry index keeps climbing up and up and up. That's going to make those exporting costs, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. landed costs to those countries grow higher. So that's really the headwind. I think domestic demand would be helpful if we could get past, you know, sort of the, the trends that have limited sort of domestic demand for wheat. That would be one outlet for the industry to consider. Well, the shining star this week, I guess we could say was cotton. Yeah. I mean, some yeah. good news hit some contract highs, actually, and that's coming off of a report showing us that we do have a large record cotton crop on our hands this year. Yeah, and that would be the, the case if you're saying for wheat, all these fundamental things that we talk about right. sometimes don't matter, and you get money flow pushing a certain direction, and that's been the case in wheat. Uh, it's, it's a two-fold problem. You have exports that have just shocked and awed the markets in the first five weeks of, of post-harvest here. And the second problem is quality. So you have yeah. kind of two crops out there. You have high mite cotton and low mite cotton. Low mite cotton might be bid 65, 60 cent range. The high quality is up around 80 cents, maybe even a little bit higher than that. So the blending that these guys are trying to do to meet these exports that are all hot at the beginning, 
They're simply just saying, we'll pay what we need now for the market. And I don't know if that's going to stop in the short term. We went to 85 cents in May. We could see that. So you think not a lot, you, you think there's more upside potential than downside risk here short term? Well, I think the upside potential is there. We're not, we haven't seen March go over May yet or okay. July. But I will say, you look at December here, December, it's really stopped going up. That might be your opportunity. You can get 73 cents right now for next year, and we are going to get more acreage. Elaine, looking more macro, tax reform, talk to our Farm Journal Washington correspondent, Jim Wiesmeyer. He said, Tyne, it's pretty certain that we'll get tax reform on the president's desk ne next week. We know that's kind of been fueling the economy, a fu fueling the stock market. This Dow, do we just continue to see it climb? I mean, is there no end in sight at this point? Those new record highs, absolutely. And I'll build on something that John said, is when you have that wealth creation from the stock market, where does that wealth go? These investors will be diversifying into other asset classes, including commodities, into cotton, into the live cattle, industry, live cattle contracts, uh, grain contracts maybe. We haven't really seen that yet, but once we get past this December time frame, I think it's a real possibility in 2018 that these record highs we're seeing in the stock market could start bringing money into our commodities. Let's hope so. All right, thank you both for being here. We need to take a quick break, but we'll get their closing thoughts when we come back from U.S. Farm Report. All right, welcome back. Time now for closing thoughts. Elaine? I think this is the time of year, absolutely, when farmers may need to think about what cash they need to the end of the year, and they need to think about that fast because the investors in the futures markets will also be thinking about getting into cash potentially. There's net long positions in corn and soybeans. Those could continue to sell off in these last couple of weeks of the year, which would add downward pressure to these already downward trending markets. So I think that's, that's the concern is that if you need to be doing anything in the near term, you need to be doing it fast. All right, Elaine, thank you, John. My thoughts would be you need to lean up, use the board. I think the, the, the margins were lowered today for corn. You're sitting on product in storage, and if you're paying to store that product, I think you have to figure out a, an efficient way to keep that upside. And there's not a, a risk-free way to do it. It's not risk-free in the bin, but you have to get yourself to a point where I think you use the cash flow the best you can. All right. Thank you both for being here. We appreciate it. We need to take a quick break, and then John Phipps joins us next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by the Enlist Weed Control System. More weed control, less drift and volatility, maximum yield potential. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by QLF. For 40 years, QLF has been proud to support American farmers that feed the world. Welcome back. Well, coming up, we're taking the show on the road from the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo. But to set the stage for our tech discussion, here's John Phipps. I recently bought a new camera to record my commentaries on the farm. I was getting along fine with the old one until a couple of weeks ago, I had an inexplicable problem with the autofocus. More unsettling to me, it seemed to fix itself, and I have no idea what happened or why. Suddenly, not having a backup camera seemed like a risky idea. Like all electronic products, the new camera has more features, capability, and raw power. I hope you notice the clips are a higher resolution. But as a girl I dated in college once told me, you're better looking in dim light. So maybe more pixels are a mixed blessing. The new camera presented what we routinely call a learning curve. When we say the curve is steep, we usually mean learning to do the basics takes considerable effort, but then it gets easier as you master the greater capabilities. Steep learning curves are one of the biggest reasons people drag their feet adopting new technology. Consequently, manufacturers are concentrating on making the most basic functions the easiest to master. This is why you'll find a quick start card or a tutorial video along with the old five pound operational manual when you buy a new machine. In fact, making technology user friendly from the get go has become a top priority. I've become a big fan of video tutorials to help learn complicated tasks. And I dislike calling technical support, despite all the courtesy and earnest efforts to help me. With a good tutorial video, you don't have to admit to another human how totally clueless you are. You can just play it a zillion times until you get it. I know it's just geezer pride, but if I can avoid looking foolish, I will. This is reason number 56, why rural broadband is more important than just watching Australian murder mysteries. I think the internet is how we are going to learn to operate our advancing technology. So when you look at all the amazing technology like we have here today, 
we had to choose from to make our farms and lives better, make sure you realize that the key to unlocking that power could be decent broadband access. Thanks, John. And as I mentioned, when we come back, we're off to the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo with so much chatter about how we're in the decade of the bean and where could yields go. How is one group working to create more value for every soybean seed produced? It's a tech discussion from Indianapolis after the break. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. From the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast, this is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome back to this special edition of U.S. Farm Report. We're on the road from the first ever Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo in Indianapolis, Indiana. Come on inside, here's a peek of what's ahead. As farmers strive for higher yields, soybean yields could be on the cusp of taking off. But it's not just about yield for some in the industry. So what's next when it comes to ag tech? We have a group of experts to give us a glimpse of the future. And in John's world, the history of new technology. All right, well, as we promised, we're here from Farm Journal's Ag Tech Expo. And the discussion today is not only about driving higher yields, but also capturing more value. And, and you know, there's, there's no better time to talk about that than right now. So on the panel this week, we have Bob Ryder with Monsanto, Ken Ferry, a farm journal agronomist, Kip Tom, a farmer in Indiana, as well as Polly Rulin, who is the new United Soybean Board CEO. So welcome. Thank you for all, all for being here. Let's jump right into things, Bob. I mean, when I hear about the yields that are coming out of these fields, especially with, with soybeans, I mean, last year we were in Illinois talking to farmers who were seeing 100 bushel per acre soybeans on average. I mean, that was unheard of five years ago. Yeah, I mean, we really are in the decade of the bean, and I think about the technologies we're now using. I mean, in our breeding programs today at Monsanto, and it really does start with the seed, the technology you use in terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning, the decision making we're applying, really breeding gene by gene to make that seed product really, really perform on the farm. And then you combine that together with you know, the challenges we all have in terms of how do we make sure that we use the right product on the right acre and we do that in a highly sustainable way and using all of that information on the farm to really drive those decisions and it's really a huge shift that we're seeing but it truly is going to make for an outstanding uh, soybean product in the future. It's an exciting time Bob but do you feel like we're starting to plateau on yields or are we just seeing what U.S. farmers are capable of when it comes to the soybean crop? No I think we've got a really long runway in fact I see an acceleration happening because of the the tools we're applying today the knowledge that we have today and then again combining that with what we can do from an agronomic perspective and really bring that precision to the farm I think you couple those two things together and I see really yields having the opportunity to really take off further. Yeah, Ken, Bob mentions agronomics, and that, that's huge. I mean, it's not just with the seed. It's also the farming practices that have changed. Do you see farmers starting to implement the same practices that they had with, like, corn? And, and you know, and, 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 and um, putting on some other uh, treatments that's really helping yield? I think so. I, for a long time, we would say that corn responds to management a lot more than soybeans do. Soybeans tend to respond to the weather, and that's starting to change now as far as the new technologies coming on allow us to actually move the bean yields like we couldn't have before. And the simple things, for instance, in Illinois, for a long time we've known it's better to plant our beans early. Right. Um, we used to plant our beans in April, and then we have sudden death that showed up mainly in the 90s that really put a stop to all of that. Now with the new seed treatments and the technology to get around that problem, we can move back to a, a, an environment you know that... Uh, allow us to plant those beans earlier and not be worried about the outcome. We literally see guys that added planters to their operations so they could implement that technology and in one year's time due to their yield increase by moving their planting up we're able to buy that planter yeah. and that's how quick farmers take, take advantage of that technology. Kip, as a farmer, what do you see as the greatest uh, technology on your farm that's really showing an ROI, whether that be with yield, whether that be with value? What is having an impact on your operation? Well, so when I look at our business, uh, we were an early integrator of a lot of these different technologies on our farm. And let's face it, we are the convergence of three technologies. You know, you have the ability to remote monitor, sense, and control. We have biotechnology that's came and advanced breeding and genetics that are available to us. And now we're taking this data science and coming back with solutions of how to better produce that crop. So 
I think it's those technologies are going to start to change our business model, at the same time giving us more information to give to our end users to understand how we're operating our farms and adding value to their products to the consumers. I know you're a big proponent of data and collecting all of that data. How much data do you capture on an annual basis? So we're collecting about a terabyte a year right now. So uh, that seems like a lot. Everybody says that's big data. I don't think we're at a big data yet. I think we've got a long way to go because uh, all the sensors are coming out, all the data science that we're applying, it's going to continue to grow. Polly, we talk about yield, and yield is so important for farmers, but at the same time, we see where yield has kind of gotten us. I mean, we we're in this oversupply situation, and it seems like I hear more farmers say, you know, we need to see more value for the products we're producing. Is that what USB is trying to do as well? Well, Kip mentioned end users, and I think at USB, it's very important for us to think about yield in the short term and value of the bean and the beans components in the long term. And so we have to look ahead and at present to make sure that farms are sustainable for the next generation and technology helps us do that. So do you feel we're just at the cusp of finding also the value? I do, I do. So we have the meal component and the oil component. We look at it as the whole bean, but we think about how to increase the value of those components. All right, Polly, thank you so much. Well, uh, we're going to pick this conversation back up in a few minutes, but first let's head back to the studio with meteorologist Mike Hoffman. I mean, Mike, you were right. The cold was here to stay, but please tell me that that changes next week. No, time. I think we get a bit of a reprieve in the eastern part of the country anyway from that cold, but it does come roaring back. Here's the jet stream as we head through the rest of this weekend into early in the week. You can see things go zonal for a while. Little bit of a trough by Wednesday into the Great Lakes in the northeast. Brings a shot of cold air just for a short period of time. And then we get an interesting setup. We have a trough digging all the way down into the southwest. This is a direct shot of Arctic air. It will be very cold air coming southward. And uh, even though the model by the weekend before Christmas tries to poke a ridge up into the southeast, I think that cold air presses pretty far through here. And this storm will have to be watched. That could cause some issues for travelers as we head into a Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. But that's all something way down the road. Here's my 30 day outlook for temperatures. Basically east of the continental divide, it's below normal, although near there, probably near normal. And then for most of the west, above normal temperatures. 30 day outlook for precipitation, northern plains, east coast above normal, central plains through the uh, west coast, probably below normal over the next 30 days. Tyne? All right, thanks so much, Mike. Well, we have a lot more to cover with this group. Before that, we're going to take a break and then we'll hear from John Phipps with a more historical view on ag technology. Please stay with us. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo is brought to you by the United Soybean Board, going beyond the bushel to maximize profit opportunities for all U.S. soybean farmers. Welcome back to Ag Tech Expo here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And, and John, I have to travel to Indianapolis to see you. Well, it, one of the advantages of never having to leave my farm, <laughs> but it's only 80 miles from me, but it is good to see you. Well, walking in and all these latest gadgets at Ag Tech Expo, but you know, adopting technologies is nothing new for farmers. And it's never been easy throughout history. Recently, there has been new interest in the ongoing debate over early civilization. In part, it was prompted by a book called Against the Grain by James Scott. By the way, you can read my review of that book in Top Producer Magazine. The author's main assertion was that sedentary agriculture, that's growing crops in a fixed location year after year, was a mixed blessing for early man and that adoption took much longer than conventional history describes. Whatever your position, if any on this discussion, it does serve to remind us that technology has always been controversial. While we picture agriculture as the foundation for civilization and the propellant for our, speci our species' phenomenal success, there is a valid point that hunter-gatherers probably didn't live as miserably as we think, and early farmers ran into some unexpected disadvantages that we casually ignore. Fast forward to the technology debate today. Farmers who are not using all the latest gadgets or electronic assists are not necessarily losers either. The economic and operational advantages we are looking at are not instant total game changers. Technological progress almost never looks like that. Each step forward yields an incremental gain and exacts a cost. I imagine farmers reluctant to jump on board the technology bandwagon feel somewhat like those hunter-gatherers watching their neighbors plant barley for the first time ever. Hey, I'm doing okay, why should I change my life? We have the advantage of recorded history, however, and its trajectory is clear. 
Technology changes our world and it changes us as well. For example, over the millennia, agriculture has reshaped our faces, digestive systems, and most importantly, our brains. Our problem is the pace is just a little bit faster than 10,000 years ago. There has never been a step along the way that was 100% problem free. That said, each step has opened up new types of work and worry we never knew existed. Keeping our technology expectations and fears in check by paying a little more attention in history class might be a good way to make our journey more productive and pleasant. Always remember, at one time, agriculture was the hot new technology. Interesting take, John. So you're saying if there's some viewers out there that are kind of more slow to adopt that technology, don't don't feel bad? No, no, it's always been that way. And there'll be a, this big war for a few years before we decide which way is going to work best. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us here. Right. We appreciate it. We need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're continuing our discussion on driving higher yields while getting more value. That discussion happens in just two minutes. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Credenz Soybean Seed from Bayer. Designed using smart genetics with tailored varieties to fit any field condition. U.S. Farm Report on the road from the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo is brought to you by the United Soybean Board. Going beyond the bushel to maximize profit opportunities for all U.S. soybean farmers. All right, welcome back to the special edition of U.S. Farm Report from the Farm Journal Ag Tech Expo. Well, we talked about a lot about yield, a little bit about value, but let's hit more of the value side of that equation. Bob, you know, for Monsanto, I know you used to have a slogan uh, that was breed better beans for one of your brands. Go into that a little bit. How are you breeding better beans today? Yeah, I think if you look at what we've been doing, um, certainly partnering with USB in terms of providing Vista of Gold, so High Lake soybeans to the market, and our breeders generally just really working to make sure that we're maintaining that right balance in terms of the outputs for protein and oil in those soybeans together with high yield. Um, in the past, you know, it was a challenge trying to drive yield and then you might suffer a little bit on those quality traits. But today with the knowledge we have and the genome and the way we do our breeding today, it, it's really changed. And so I think there's just still a huge opportunity to improve the quality overall of the crop and, and drive yields at the same time. Polly, when, when we look at the value, you know, when you go out and USB, you know, generating more demand and, you, and you're going to other countries, um, you know, what are other countries looking for? What do they want to see in U.S. soybeans uh, to maybe generate more demand? You know, when other countries talk about U.S. soy, they talk about quality, and by that, they mean sustainability. It's kind of strange the way that other companies view uh, what we do in this country. So, USB, part of our um, long-range strategic plan is to focus on sustainability and to focus on the value that sustainability offers, especially overseas. That's not a, um, a journey that happens overnight. It's a journey of continual improvement. And so uh, at USB, we're really interested in not only the value of the bean itself, but the value that the sustainability of our farmers offers to international customers. Looking at the value side of it, Kip, that, and, and, and so much focus from USB on that, that has to be refreshing to hear as a producer, uh, because I know this is something uh, that you've been wanting for a long time. Yeah, so well, let's face it, uh, they've done a lot to drive yields higher and we know we need to extract more value and hopefully to be in a coordinated supply chain where we have specific products we're growing for specific end uses. And, and the customer, that means something to different, every customer. So we've got one company we're working with right now that's producing a contract that is going to get direct into the food chain that uh, they're looking at our sustainability as we just spoke about briefly. They want to see what our carbon footprint is. They want to know how much water we're consuming to produce this crop, how much crop nutrients are being used, what's our use of pesticides, and are we being efficient with our energy use on the farm. So uh, that's becoming more and more important, and I think we have the data systems today that can support that uh, system. Yeah, and you know, Kip's been talking a lot about data, Ken, but how does it play, how does it factor in for you? Of course, I mean, the, you can't make the good decisions without the good data as far as where it is. And fortunately for most production, we talk about sustainability. That also comes with profitability, meaning that if you're, if you're getting the biggest uh, return out of your investment as far as water and nutrients and that type of thing, you're, you're more sustainable. If you can raise more bushels on less inputs, for instance, you, you become more sustainable with it. So the only way to track that down is to look at the data, look at the yield maps and all the other data that can be generated by the companies here in this room as far as, um, you know, am I doing this the right way? Am I meeting all the nutrient requirements for the crop? 
where is the weakest link and can I fix that? How does Monsanto kind of collect that data then and use that to make some of your decisions uh, for the future? Right, so a huge part of it is, you know, historically we would collect data from our own research programs and then we'd help with that to make decisions and provide that data and knowledge to growers. But today, grower data is really becoming the key thing. And, um, you know, we're working with growers through our climate field view applications to help collect that data and then help to really harness that data for the grower to make the right decisions on their farm. Because as Ken says, this whole idea about um, making better decisions and helping that grower be successful and be sustainable, it's all about making those decisions in a very customized way. But you're going to be using data from a whole bunch of farms that yeah. uh, are, are somewhere else in another part of the country or another part of the world. And Paul, I imagine taking some of that data and being able to show other countries what U.S. soybean farmers are doing to be more su sustainable and improving practices, that, that has to help. Well, and I think that's where we're going with the sustainability work of USB, is to be able to say, here's where we are now, and here are some measurements for the future, and here is how we have grown our sustainability over time. And that's the kind of data that I think other countries need when they rely on us telling them that they're sustainable. Listen, I've heard it's the decade of the bean. I've heard we've got a long runway. Um, some of these long-reaching plans, now's the time. Now's the time for value of the bean. Now's the time to increase sustainability. We're in a great spot. It is an exciting time. All right, well, what's next? Um, we're going to take a quick break. We have tractor tails, but at the very end of the show, that's what I'm asking this panel. What's next, and what are they most excited about? Please stay with us. Tractor Tales is brought to you by John Deere. Where can you find the most comprehensive inventory of John Deere certified pre-owned tractors, combines, and sprayers? Machinefinder.com. Sometimes the best new addition to your fleet isn't new. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week we're in Waterloo, Illinois, with the story of a very cool 1967 John Deere 4020 that belongs to the family of Derek Gregson. And Derek, this particular 4020 has a family connection. Why don't you... Uh, Fill us in. Yeah, this is my grandpa's. Uh, he bought it and farmed with it. And I guess back when he quit farming and they sold it in I think, 95 or 94, 95, something like that, they sold it. Two years ago, a cousin of ours found it on Craigslist and he called me and asked me about it because he thought it might have been our old tractor that my grandpa had. Now, there was one particular feature that caught his yeah, eye, right? The, they described it and they said it didn't have no PTO in it. And he recognized it as my grandfather's tractor not having no, no PTO in it, so he called me and asked me about it, and I said, yeah, that sounds like it could be the same one, you know, so we went and checked it out the next night, and sure enough, it was it. I had serial number of it, and, and it turned out to be grandpa's tractor, and so we bought it and brought it on home with us that night. What did it feel like to find grandpa's tractor oh, the first time you saw it? It was, it was pretty nice getting it back, you know, just, uh, yeah, it's, Look a little rough from what I remembered it, but you know we we changed that. We made it like new again. So yeah, the, it looks it looks absolutely like new now, Derek. And you did the the work yourself. Yeah, me between me and Dad, we did all, most all the work ourselves. Yeah. Staying right here, it ain't going nowhere. That's for sure. So won't, won't, won't never leave again. I'm sure get passed down to next generation, hopefully. So. Thanks, Greg. Well, from old to new, we have virtual reality behind us here at the Ag Tech Expo. But what is next when it comes to ag technology? We'll discuss with the panel coming up on U.S. Farm Report. All right, welcome back to the special edition of U.S. Farm Report. To close this out, we've talked so much about ag technology. What's next? What are you most excited about? Bob, we'll start with you. Yeah, for me, it's what we've been talking about. It's bringing everything together in an integrated way, harnessing all of the tools that we have together in a way that really is seamless, integrated, and really drives things the way farmers need to drive them. All right, Ken? I, I think our ability is getting faster and better at collecting that data and analyzing that data. And there'll be some things that you see here today that how will that ever affect me, but it's the beginning of, of somewhere down the road. Said, man, that led to this and that led to that. And uh, the improvements that are going to come with the technology that continues to flow are going to be good. All right, Kip? Yeah, so just to build upon what they got to say, those technologies, we're going to have blockchain. Remember that word, blockchain. Start researching it because it's going to be part of the future of agriculture, creating a seamless timeline, a seamless load of information, all the way from the genetics all the way to the consumer, so that adds that transparency. 
blockchain technology. All right, Polly? Yeah, and I think that's right, because if we have farmers that are producing a terabyte of data a year and every one of them becomes like you, <laughs> we're going to have some sort of sorting process and process to get that information back. And I think you're right, that technology is very important. But the challenge is going to be harnessing the data we collect and using it to its best potential. Yes. All right, well, I'm excited. Last weekend on the show, I had some experts who said, you know, we're kind of in, in phase 1.0. And we're just on the cusp of really discovering uh, ag technology and where it's going to take us. So thank you for the discussion this weekend. We really appreciate you joining us. For all of us at U.S. Farm Report, thank you so much. Be sure to join us right here next week as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report has been brought to you by Ram Commercial, America's longest-lasting heavy-duty pickups. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.